British Columbia's northern coastal border region. It is a collection of snow-covered mountain ranges, icy winding rivers, and unique border towns, separating Canada from the state of Alaska. Incredible wildlife sanctuaries. The Kutsmutin Grizzly Bear Sanctuary is about 45 miles to the north of Prince Rupert. It's an amazing area. A unique transportation infrastructure. Sometimes that water gets so rough that the boats can't actually travel there. And cultural traditions living on after 12,000 years. For over a thousand years, and we pass it on from one generation to the next. Now, we reveal the coastlines like never before, unlocking the secrets of our maritime past, present, and future. Canada, over the edge. Northern British Columbia is a rarely seen natural wonder. Set apart from most of BC's towns and cities, the landscape is timeless and pristine. Not far from remote Highway 16 stands Seven Sisters Provincial Park. The park and protected area encompass the mountaintops and rich forested ecosystems below. The area measures nearly 40,000 hectares and is traditional territory of the Jimshan and Kitshan First Nations. High above the protected forests, the peaks of Seven Sisters are a signature image here. Five of the sisters tower more than 2,000 meters. The tallest peak is 2,750 meters high and dominates the landscape. The Seven Sisters are the tallest peaks along the famed Yellowhead Route. stretching from Mount Robson inland to the Pacific Ocean.
The landscape changes as we move northwest. Mountains and rich forests are left behind. Rolling hills stretch for kilometers. Tiny lakes and streams dot this landscape, far from civilization. The hills are mostly barren, with patches of sparse vegetation, revealing a palette of colors that seem of another world. Further northwest, we approach Niska Memorial Lava Bed Park. A violent eruption took place here just 250 years ago. Lava flowed downstream to the valley below. It spread and hardened, leaving behind a geological wonder measuring 178 square kilometers. The park is also a memorial to the Niska people who co-manage the area. Their oral history records unthinkable tragedy. The eruption here destroyed two villages, killing 2,000 people. Further northwest, the landscape changes yet again as hardened lava becomes glacial ice. This is the Cambria Ice Field, named after the ancient geological era some 500 million years ago. It measures more than 1,400 square kilometers, located in the boundary ranges of the Coast Mountains. The ice field can be reached by boat from the Portland Canal to the west, 
from the Glacier Highway to the north. It sits just kilometers from the BC-Alaska border. Weather conditions here can be extreme. Avalanches are a common danger. The ice field is a mix of glacial peaks, including Bear Glacier, Otter Mountain, and Cambria Peak. Some of these icy summits soar more than two kilometers high. And at the heart of the Cambria ice field, massive gentle ice sheets stretch as far as the eye can see. It is a surreal and stunning landscape. British Columbia's northern marine border with the United States is a mix of evolving landscapes. Just kilometers from the Cambria ice field, the town of Stewart, BC lies in the distance. The first permanent settlers arrived here in the late 19th century, prospectors in search of gold. In the early 20th century, four brothers with the family name Stewart arrived and declared the town the gateway to the Klondike. Miners arrived in droves. Prior to World War I, Stewart was home to more than 10,000 people. But in recent years, mining here has declined. Today, Stewart is a northern transportation hub. It's Canada's northernmost ice-free port, open to marine traffic year-round. And Stewart is equally known for its unique neighbor, Hyder, Alaska. Hyder is Alaska's easternmost town. It is completely surrounded by wilderness, so remote it is one of the few points in the United States without a guarded border crossing. Visitors are free to enter, but clear Canadian customs on the way out. Lifting off from Stewart, morning mist and cloud cover are signature features. In a region that receives more than 1,800 millimeters of precipitation each year.
Heading northwest, icy abandoned mining roads follow the contours of Salmon River and lead to one of the region's natural gems. Salmon Glacier is the fifth largest glacier in North America. High above the abandoned mining roads, the true beauty of this region is revealed. Salmon Glacier lies barely a kilometer from the BC Alaska border, just inside Canadian territory. Vast fields of ice spread for kilometers. oblivious to the nearby international boundary. Salmon Glacier is one of hundreds of magnificent glaciers in the boundary ranges. Heading south from Stewart, we follow the contours of the Portland Canal. It is a pristine body of water, extending more than 100 kilometers to the open waters of the Pacific. It is lined by magnificent forests and towering cliff faces. The icy waters are shrouded in mist and fog through much of the year. The canal was explored by Captain George Vancouver in 1793. Vancouver preserved the canal's British legacy by naming it in honor of the Duke of Portland, who would later serve as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. But British and Canadian sovereignty along this international boundary has not always been secure. Portland Canal was controversial territory during the Alaska Boundary Dispute, a 19th century border conflict between Russia and Britain, later inherited by Canada and the United States. In 1903, three Americans, two Canadians, and one British representative formed a mixed tribunal, tasked with marking the border once and for all. In a surprise move, the British representative sided with American negotiators 
and the international border ended as a compromise. Roughly halfway between the maximum territorial demand from both sides. From the Pacific Ocean to Salmon Glacier, British Columbia's marine boundary with the state of Alaska is a scenic wonder. Heading south from Portland Canal, we travel cross country over dense forests and mountains. The region is remote and uninhabited by humans. This is grizzly bear territory and the site of the Kutzmatin Grizzly Bear Sanctuary. The protected area measures more than 44,000 hectares, giving free reign to one of the world's most majestic creatures. Kutzmatin Grizzly Bear Sanctuary. It's about two hours by boat. It's an amazing area. Um, in, in 1992, they made it into a Grizzly Bear Sanctuary. We go up there every day, May, June, and July, and we see grizzly bears. It's quite remarkable. Grizzly bears roaming these hills are formidable creatures. Some measure more than two meters tall. But they are amazing animals, uh, and to be able to see them in their natural uh, habitat, uh, doing what they do on a daily basis. The biggest bear in the inlet, I'd say he's about 900 pounds, and he's getting fairly old now. I understand he's 27 years old, and uh, we'll see uh, every year, I think, oh, he's maybe his last season, but every year he comes out and he's still the dominant bear in the inlet. Doug Davis says the creation of the Grizzly Sanctuary came with years of pressure and lobbying. He believes it was a positive step. That area has one of the largest concentrations of bears anywhere on the coast, so uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. Well, there was quite a movement, uh, and, it, and it took uh, some time to get it into it, to be a sanctuary area. And, uh, you know, thank goodness that uh, people had the foresight to, to, to do that. The future looks bright for the grizzlies and the coots mateen. Uh, every year we're seeing more and more cubs and, uh, and, and we're seeing grizzlies uh, venture out from the coots mateen. Uh, they are spreading into their um, regional area. There is no hunting on grizzly bears from the Skeena watershed all the way to the Nass watershed. That's about 70 miles of coastline as well as a huge area of upper or inland uh, area as well that, uh, that there is no hunting on these bears so they are not threatened. And, uh, and they are safe.
Heading southwest, more glacial peaks mark a return to human civilization. This is the city of Terrace, home to more than 11,000 people. It is surrounded by beauty, set on the banks of the Skeena River. Terrace is the center of commerce for the region and the hub of transportation, with the railway extending from Terrace to the ports of the Pacific. It is also key traditional territory for the Jimshan First Nation. The Jimshan people occupy well over 200 miles of coastline. It extends from uh, the city of Prince Rupert, extends westward, extends eastward inland, extends north to the Nass River. And the Jimshan people are made up of nine different tribes. Archaeological sites throughout the region record the presence of the Jimshan peoples dating back 12,000 years. At the Museum of Northern British Columbia's Longhouse in Prince Rupert, Jimshan traditions live on. This is a modern interpretation of a Jimshan longhouse. Uh, it's an, uh, pretty much an identical replica of that. The traditions are passed on from one generation to the next, right up till today, and they're passed on orally. And our First Nations people, they never ever wrote anything down, and it's still the same today. They don't, the old people don't like to write anything down. They'll tell you your history, and if you don't remember it, you don't use it. Sam Bryant and others perform a number of ceremonial dances, traditions passed on through time. So the song and dance that we're gonna do is a, a song and dance that is done when they welcome people into their homes, into their houses when the feasts were on. So the host tribe would have a chief, would have a singer sing a song, and he would come out and he would dance and he would spread the eagle down amongst the people in his house. This was welcoming them into the house peacefully. Another dance comes from Vancouver Island, celebrating the arrival of the Olican. A small fish that was a valuable source of food and oil. When the Olican start running, it's a very happy time because it runs at the end of winter. And it's one of the first foods that you have that you can gather and it's fills your belly again, so the people are very happy when the olecans start running because they also can make grease out of it. And the girls here, they will do the 
dancing for for us and the guys here will do our song. So when you see the drums do this, it's like when they scrape, uh, push the olecan grease into the buckets and the girls will do the imitations of gathering the olecan from the river. Bryant believes the longhouse and these ceremonies are crucial for the modern Jim Shan peoples. I think it's very important that we keep all our culture, our histories, we keep them alive because it gives the young children a sense of identity that this is where you belong. This is the house you belong in. These are the tribes that you belong to. These are your stories, your songs, and your dances. So they have a feeling that as they grow older, that uh, this is gonna belong to them. So we need to look after it and we need to pass it on from one generation to the next. The marine boundary dividing British Columbia and Alaska is marked by incredible fjords and towering glaciers. Just southeast of the city of Terrace, the Skeena River makes a remarkable run towards the open waters of the Pacific set just a mountain range away from Alaska. In the 1860s, the river bustled with activity, steamboats coming and going during the Amanika Gold Rush era. Today, it is famous for sport fishing. Salmon and steelhead populations are in abundance here. The Skeena holds the second richest sockeye salmon habitat in Canada, with more than 70 spawning grounds. Three point eight million salmon spawn each year, drawing adventurers from around the world for a chance to explore these waters. The Skeena also lies adjacent to a remarkable roadway. This stretch of the Yellowhead Highway is considered one of the world's great road trips. It is a winding, magnificent journey, following the contours of the Skeena, flanked by incredible mountains on either side. The Yellowhead Highway stretches nearly 3,000 kilometers, linking Canada's four western provinces. This final stretch was not completed until World War II, 
providing American convoys access to isolated Prince Rupert, a key staging ground for deployments to the Pacific. Today, the region is still relatively isolated. Boats, ferries, and float planes are key to Prince Rupert and the surrounding region, a unique feature on approach to the Pacific coast. We're in uh, Prince Rupert, British Columbia. It's about uh, 450 miles um, northwest of Vancouver. It is pretty, a pretty rugged shoreline up here. If you were to fly around this area and you look down, there's a lot of rivers, inlets, and um, and you know, jagged shoreline uh, to access here. Michael Cote is a pilot with Northern Pacific Seaplanes, a float plane operator in the region. Flying around in the, uh, the bush planes up here is, uh, is handy because um, you know, a lot of the communities that we fly to are on their own separate islands. So the float plane, uh, you know, helps uh, the, co the north coast out a lot by uh, just making it quicker uh, access in and out of the villages, you know, as well as logging camps and, uh, and, and fishing camps as well. Cote relies on experience, common sense, and a brand of plane that has been used here for decades. Yeah, we fly the uh, de Havilland Beaver. It is regarded as the uh, workhorse of the North Coast. They're ideal for these areas because you got, uh, you know, short takeoff performance and landing. Um, you know, they can pack a pretty heavy load for uh, what a lot of our passengers and customers consider a smaller aircraft. They do, they do the work of, uh, you know, of what you, you would consider a, a larger airplane. Operating a plane from water can present challenges. When you're in the water, uh, one of your big concerns is, is drag with the floats. Up here, it's uh, you get a lot of strong winds up in this area, creating rough water, and uh, so, you know sometimes the uh, the rough water can can be a bit much for some people. With experience up here, you can you can uh, manage quite quite easily. But float planes can offer advantages. Sometimes when you're on wheels and you're on a runway, you can't always get the, uh, the wind directly on the nose of the aircraft. And one of the things I really like about flying float planes is that you can uh, easily take off into wind. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty neat um, taking someone for their first ever float plane ride. Um, we, we do quite a few tour, uh, sightseeing tours up here and we get a lot of people from Europe and, uh, and other parts of the world. And the first question I ask them when we head down towards the plane is, uh, have they ever been in a float plane before? And a lot of the times it's no. And, uh, and they're, they're a little nervous. You can, you can sense ner nervousness. They get inside and they're kind of looking for the life jackets. And, uh, and I can understand, uh, you know, how, how they could uh, feel odd about being in a float plane. Um, but when they get back, it's the smiles on their face tell the story. These planes also provide an essential service on this coast supplies in and out of the villages and flying people in and out of the villages uh, sometimes that water gets so rough that the boats can't actually travel there and we can get airborne and climb up over top the uh, rough turbulence and, and make it into to a lot of the villages in, in, in a nice safe you know calm manner but one of the big things with landing on uh, on the water here with these float planes 
number one is the water conditions and you know, direction of wind, as well as uh, debris in the water. The first thing you have to do when you're landing in a float plane is, a, is what we call a circuit, so you'll actually fly over and take a look at the water where we're gonna touch down, and you, you have to think ahead, you have to be ahead of the airplane. Scout out where you're gonna land based on the wind direction, and then uh, look there to see if you got any debris and see if there's any oncoming boats. Keep a watch on uh, on what's going on in the water. The big difference on floats is you gotta you gotta kind of hold the yoke back just before you touch down so that the, the plane doesn't dig in on you in the uh, in the water because that because that water does create a lot of drag on the floats. For Michael Cote, the skies surrounding Prince Rupert are more than a job. They are part of his family story here. When I turned 18, I, you know, I'd done one year of uh, college or school at the college here, and I uh, went home and just told my dad, I said, "Hey, listen, business isn't for me. I'm going to go down and uh, and get my pilot's license." Two and a half years later, I moved back to Prince Rupert, and he taught me how to fly on floats. And roughly a year after that, I got a job up here flying uh, for the same company as him, and uh, we actually worked together for about three years. The Pacific coast of northern British Columbia is a remarkable stretch of jagged shoreline and tiny islands, just kilometers from the Alaska border. On the horizon, Haida Gwaii lies more than 60 kilometers away. This is the northern extremity of more than 25,000 kilometers of BC marine perimeter. Far below, incredible marine wildlife inhabits these waters. Columbia. As far north as you can go on the Inside Passage. Uh, we're about 72 miles away from Ketchikan, Alaska. We have some of the best whale watching uh, in, in the world. With his state-of-the-art adventure boat, Inside Passage, Davis takes visitors to explore these waters. The team heads offshore. Yeah, we've been doing whale watching here for 18 years, so you do get to uh, know where the whales hang out. It's a high feed area in northern Chatham Sound, and uh, it's, it's an area where it goes from 2,000 feet deep right up into about 300 feet deep. So you get a lot of exchange of water in between those two areas, which creates a lot of, a lot of feed in the area. Humpbacks are all about where the feed is. Just kilometers from Prince Rupert, Davis spots a whale but he decides to carry on. There's our first whale right over here. Just gotta keep an eye over that way because you never know what they're gonna do. We try to find whales in the largest numbers. Uh, I know we just saw a whale right here, but we're gonna keep on traveling north and uh, see if we can get onto numbers of whales instead of just one. Three hours into the journey, Inside Passage reaches its initial charted course, but the seas are too stormy. The, the weather here is a, a little bit funny with the waves. It would be a bit hard. He wants to go a little bit further north. They carry on. Finally, a good vantage point. The observation deck opens. The whale watchers are rewarded almost immediately. They head closer to shore in the hopes of seeing these magnificent creatures up close and personal. The anticipation of what's gonna happen next is always there. I'm always trying to show the best of these animals that uh, we can, and, uh, it's, but it, it's always challenging. It's all about being in the right place at the right time. The move pays off. It is an incredible display with humpbacks seemingly everywhere.
For some on this coast, whales are an everyday sight. But for visitors from around the world, it is the opportunity of a lifetime. Davis believes adventures like this contribute to the success of the whale population here. It puts a face to the whales so that they, they have an opinion on the whales when, when, we're, uh, when it comes up to, say, uh, people wanting to go uh, whaling again. So, no, these animals are magnificent animals and, uh, and uh, we're blessed to have them so close to just outside our harbor. From the evolving, incredible landscapes of the northern British Columbia interior. To the incredible contours of the Skeena River and Yellowhead Highway. to the wildlife sanctuaries of this region. British Columbia's northern coastal border region defies the imagination. It is home to protected sanctuaries, including soaring peaks and subsea habitats. And cultural legacies dating back thousands of years. It is one of the world's most remarkable international boundaries. here on the edge of Canada.